Okay, and can everybody see the screen? Mm -hmm. Great. So to, to, to open up today, I would ask that we all take a moment of silence. Um, my, our hearts, I'm sure, were already heavy from the local event that happened with the car accidents and the six seniors from Amherst Regional. But yesterday, we had a candlelight vigil for them. And to come home to find out that there was another mass shooting was um, pretty hard and just created even more of a, a heartache. And so at the sound of the singing bell, I'm going to ask for everyone just to go ahead and take that moment. And I will ask that we all come back together. And so this is the second year that the town council has approved a, a proc an AAPI proclamation. And so I'm very honored. And um, the proclamation was sponsored by councilors Mandy Johanneke and Michelle Miller. And community sponsors are the Human Rights Commission, Professor Richard Chu, Dr. Leo Wang, Yasmin, Patty Misi Forbes, Manis, Manakashi, Barath, and Milan King. And um, Michelle and Mandy, do you guys want to go ahead and read that? Absolutely. Are you, oh, I have it actually, hi everyone. <laughs> I have it on my computer, so I'll just read it off of there because it was a little small for me on the, um, okay, here we go. Wait, Michelle, before you start, since yeah. we have Anika and Anna here, do we wanna just split it two, 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 two then? That sounds fantastic, yes. Um, I can start and then if um, Anika, uh, do you want to jump in for the second two? Do you have it pulled up? And Anna, do you have it pulled up? <laughs> no, I was just having a small moment of panic as I tried to pull it up. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. And for sure. Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage in the United States was celebrated beginning in 1978 and was made into a month long event in 1992 and Whereas Asian American and Pacific Island Heritage Month seeks to honor and recognize the contributions of US residents and communities originating from Asia and the native and indigenous peoples from the Pacific Islands and. Whereas today more than 20 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders live in the United States and through their actions, make the United States of America a more vibrant, diverse, prosperous, welcoming, inclusive, and peaceful nation. And whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have distinguished themselves as leading researchers in science, medicine, and technology, as innovative farmers and ranchers, as distinguished lawyers, judges, and government leaders, as prominent contributors to the arts, literature, and sports, as restaurant workers, national technicians, I'm sorry, the screen is blocking, farm workers and other service and workforce industries, as war heroes who defined our, our country, who defended our country from fascism, and as peacetime healthcare heroes, currently on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, and Whereas Amherst's population is more than 18% Asian American and Pacific Islander and includes devoted community members. And whereas, as we celebrate the achievements and contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that enrich our history, society, and culture, we must also acknowledge the additional determination, hard work, and perseverance AAPI individuals must put forth to be heard and seen. 
and that these additional efforts are a response to inequitable institutional, institutional, excuse me, and systemic injustices fueled by xenophobia, misogyny, ableism, classism, and other forms of discrimination, such as those most recently manifested in racist attacks on Asian Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and whereas, despite their contributions and leadership, the role of AAPI individuals in the United States has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the teaching and study of American history. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we ask you to join us in the town's Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month celebration going on right now. Uh, thank you very much and so I'm just going to back up a little bit because for some reason I do these all the time and I just always get so nervous I'm not sure why but we're I would like to do some introductions if that's okay with everybody I think that part is very important and I um and I'm just going to use go in the order that my that people are showing up in the zoom so I'm going to start with Dr. Leo Wang Oh, you're muted. Hello, my name is Leo Huang, and I'm the um, Assistant Academic Dean at UMass Amherst for uh, the College of Natural Sciences, and I'm also on the Asian American Pacific Islander Commission for Massachusetts. And should I pass it off to the next person next to me? Uh, sure. Okay, uh, right next to me is Annika. Annika. Okay. Hi, I'm Anika Lopes, artist, creative consultant, and I'm a town councilor for Amherst representing District 4. And let's see, so I will see next Richard Chu. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Chu. I'm a faculty at the History Department at UMass, and I'm also a commissioner of the Asian American Pacific Islander Commission of Massachusetts. And I'll pass it on to Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Devlin Gothier. I am a District 5 town councilor. I'm thrilled to be here. I do apologize. I have to leave you a little early, but I'm excited to be here. And I will pass it to Mandy Jo. Thank you. I'm Mandy Jo Haneke, and I am one of the at large counselors on the town council. Um, and I am also thrilled to be here, but I also have to apologize. I have a concert to attend tonight to benefit the um, Ukraine, to raise money for the Ukraine war um, and the Ukrainians there. So I will be leaving early to head to play that concert in Springfield, but I'm excited to be here for now. And I need to pass it on to um, Phila Sun. Hey, I'm Phila Sun. Um, I'm a Amherst school counselor. Um, and I'm also a resident or was a resident. I've been living in the area for most of my life. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Michelle Miller. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Miller and I am a town councilor representing District 1 and really happy to be here and glad we were able to get this and organize this and pull it together. So thank you. Um, and I am going to pass it on to Philip Avila. Avila. Hi, everyone. I'm a co-chair for the Human Rights Commission, also live in town and work at the Amherst Survival Center. I will pass it on to Richard. Oh, I've, I've done my part, so oh. something, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Is it my turn? Yes. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm waiting for my son to come back at the Shrine Hospital. He had his uh, cancer on his arm. So good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Soken Mao. I use the, uh, I'm a former Amos Public School uh, teacher, Cambodian teacher uh, from 91 until 2003. So I have been here since 1982. And I basically know almost every family in Amherst, Northampton, and East Hampton areas. And uh, so here I am, and nice meeting you all. Thank you. And um, Liz? 
Okay, I'm unmuted, yay. Um, hi, I'm Liz Haygood, and I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission of Amherst and a former teacher at Amherst Regional High School. Thank you. And I'm now gonna pass it over to Professor Richard Chu just to give us a brief explanation of how May became the month for AAPI to be celebrated in. Hello everyone. So thank you again, uh, especially to the uh, sponsors, the Town Council of Amherst and uh, the Human Rights Commission. So um, I'm honored to be part of this celebration of AAPI month. Um, so some people are asking why has May been designated as the, the month to celebrate this. Uh, uh, and uh, according to, to history, um, there are two significant events in May. Uh, one was in May of 1843, which uh, was the beginning of the immigration of Japanese to the United States. And another one was in May of 1869, when uh, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad was completed in which uh, many Chinese American or Chinese workers helped build. So because of these uh, two significant events, uh, May was considered as the uh, AAPI Heritage Month. And um, so here we are. And uh, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you want me to talk about the, uh, the oral history project um, before we show the video or? Oh, yes, please. We just also had one more human rights commissioner hop on. And so I just wanted him to go ahead and and introduce himself. Cedric, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm just setting up my phone so you can see me well. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? I am Cedric Gane. I am of the human rights panel uh, members. And uh, very nice. And thank you for having me here. And thank you for the celebration, everybody. Thank you. And um, yes, Professor Chu, would you like to go ahead and explain the oral history project, please? Thank you. Um, so I teach history at the, at the UMass and the five colleges. And one of the courses that I teach is Asian American history. And uh, the course has a, has a civic engagement component in which the students, um, they complete a, a final project at the end of the semester in which they interview uh, a member of the different Asian American communities in Western Massachusetts. So for the last, uh, about last seven years, um, my students have been recording uh, these oral histories and these oral histories have been uploaded on to the UMass Special Collections and Archives Division. And the goal of this uh, oral history project is to help preserve the, the voices of uh, oftentimes unrecognized um, Asian American community members within, you know, in our midst. And uh, we are fortunate to have uh, one of uh, the interviewees, uh, Pila Son, here. And uh, soon we will be viewing the, the interview that was conducted by my students uh, on Pila Son's life. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, Pila, are there any words that you would like to say to open up, or are you? Uh, I think um, this is short and, you know. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, maybe we can ask uh, Soken or Pila to say something about the Cambodian American community in Amherst. Uh, a little br a brief history of, uh, of your community. They like you to go my ahead. elder. No, no, I want my elder to tell me. <laughs> right. Fella, Sorry. thank you so much. I love you, fella. All right. So, uh, again, um, the first Cambodian came to Amos was uh, February 1981. My brother, uh, the oldest brother, was a second family came to Amherst. 
and that was sometime in May of uh, 1981. And most of us came through a sponsor uh, through the local churches. So the Emma Lutheran Church sponsored my families and and the other church uh, sponsor, the Christ Church sponsored the Wu family. So every church know us by the last name. So, and, um, and then after the main family arrived, each family also started to sponsor extended family from the refugee camps and to the Amherst area. So most of the people in Amherst, Northampton, East Hampton, and Holyoke, are all sponsored by the church. And these are the people originally came from a refugee camps in Thai Cambodian Thailand border. And the fortunate people who sponsored by the local churches also were baptized as a Christian before all the local churches be able to sponsor us. So that's why we are all converted to Christian. And therefore the local church be able to sponsor us. Uh, that's how we end up to the Amos area for the first time. And since then, our family were grew, the Cambodian community have grew in the East Hampton and Northampton area. Amos is the only town, the only school in the United States that helped Cambodian, all the Cambodian like myself, to go back to get education. Uh, I start school. Uh, in, uh, in um, September uh, 1982, and I came here on April 1982, and I was 18 years old. And our uh, guidance counselor, which is Lauren Kavanaugh, uh, was living and working in Cambodia for more than 10 years. So when we want to go to school, she basically asked the school um, a superintendent and the town give us a chance to attend school. So when we graduated, most of us, most of my friends, uh, we graduated at like 20 years old, 22 years old, and we were good at sports. All of us are good at soccer and volleyball. And all of the school were so jealous at us that why we are so good at sport and they want to see the birth certificate because we look older than, <laughs> than we're supposed to be. But we are the most fortunate uh, community in this area. There's a school in our areas, uh, in Northampton, Amherst, accept us to attend school again, give us a second chance. And not only that, most of the local churches who sponsor the families help to raise money and to help us also to build the Cambodian uh, Buddhist temple, which is next to the Peace Pagoda. So that's how our community start growing. Not only help us to sponsor extended families member, but also help to fund uh, to do fundraising to help us to build the Cambodian Buddhist temple in Lavrat. And beside that, the most most important of all, Emma School is the only school that help us to create Cambodian. Um, to create a course that teach only Cambodian language and culture to the Cambodian students, besides uh, allow them to take academic um, to graduate from Amherst High School. Cambodians allowed to take a uh, learn Cambodian class uh, 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 language and culture. So we are the only school in the United States and Amherst Town is the only town that help us create about just everything to have Cameron life start new again. And that is how we end up here. And that's why I never leave Amherst since then. Bella, <laughs> you want to add? Um, and, you know, I think my story picks up where that left off because I'm, I'm, my family is a transplant. And so, yeah. Okay. So I'm, going to go ahead and start. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. You're, uh, how do I say? Wow, I really hope we can cut this off because now we're really can starting. Can we hear? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for coming to our interview. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, a couple of quick general questions. Uh, can you please state your full name? 
Yeah, uh, my name is Pila Sun, um, and I am a, a community member, Cambodian community member in Amherst. Um, and I was born in the Philippines in a refugee camp. Um, and shortly afterwards, I immigrated to the US where we first settled in Camden, New Jersey before coming to Amherst. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've been um, since I was six. All right, and I know we've already started recording, but just to have your verbal consent, uh, do we have permission to record this interview? Yes. All right. So just a few questions. So we have a general idea of what happened in the refugee camps before you came to the US. What was your family like before living in the refugee camps? Um, well, I can't, I don't have any personal experience on that, but um, hearing from my, my parents and my brothers, um, their life before um, leaving for the refugee camp, it was a difficult one. They, they dealt with like extreme poverty. Um, my dad, told me that at my age, um, he was really just looking for work to be able to feed himself and be able to just like live. Um, and so their life in back in um, Vietnam where they're from was, uh, it, it was really challenging. Um, and they lived in like a, an extreme poverty and um, you know, is where everyday essentials, things that we take for granted sometimes, it's, it, it was like a everyday struggle to try to secure food and water and um, yeah, and shelter and stuff, so yeah. Um, I know you said you were rather young when you were in the refugee camps. Did the experience of living in the refugee camps affect your parents or yourself differently you feel from versus when they were living before the Viet before the um refugee um i mean so um like the refugee camp itself it was um it was almost like a holding place for them where they went to just basically where they escaped um vietnam and they went there to learn English and also to wait for sponsorship to go to the US. Um, and the way that they got there, um, they had to walk about three or 400 miles through Vietnam and Cambodia to get to Thailand. And when they made it to Thailand, um, they had to wait there for some time before being transferred over to the Philippines. Um, and their journey to get to the refugee camp in the Thailand, it was filled with a lot of um, times where they didn't think that they were gonna make it. Um, they left with a group, they left Vietnam with a group. Um, and my brother told me that he can remember people in that group, like they had to leave behind because they just were too weak um, and they just couldn't carry on. And so they had to leave people behind on their way to the refugee camp. Um, and so I think it was a relief once they got to the refugee camp um, because they've, they, had to, they had to travel at night um, because if they were to travel during the day and they were to be spotted by Khmer Rouge or anybody else, there was a potential for them to get captured or killed or um, whatnot. And so um, the life in the refugee camp, their experience in there, um, I think it was, you know, they were happy to be there. They were happy to make it and pass their journey. But, um, you know, it, it was, um, essentially like a camp um, where people just are trying to survive. And so there was, there was like a lot of people with them. Like, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but it was, 
you know, it was a camp where people were just trying to survive. They had, um, I believe it was missionaries and, and other organizations that were there to try to help them um, was getting sponsorship to their uh, different countries, like first world countries, and also to teach them English um, and just to teach them about what life will be like um, for when they immigrated. Um, and in the, actually in the refugee camps, um, my, my mom contracted hepatitis B and um, I was actually born with that. And as a kid, or I don't know if I was born with it, but I caught it as a kid. Um, and I recovered. Um, and so now I'm immune to it. But, you know, the conditions in a refugee camp weren't the best. You know, was, I believe there was like open sewage and just, you know, it, it was it was a camp with thousands of people in there um, just trying to survive and trying to and holding on to hope. Uh, to be able to leave at some point and um, get to a different country. Um, some people in that refugee camp weren't, uh, were sent back home if they like failed the interview or, you know, um, like the countries that were there that were doing interviews and screenings, if they didn't see them as fit or didn't see them um, meeting certain criteria, they were just sent home. Um, or just sent and just basically their fates were to be, stay there or go back home. Um, but my family was able to get sponsored by um, relatives and friends that we had in New Jersey. That sounds like a, quite a journey that they had to go through and definitely a struggle. So it must have been a relief to them to have who have um, traveled out of the refugee camps. Do you mind telling me who did you immigrate with and when did your family immigrate to the United States? Uh, we immigrated in the 1990 and um, it, was, it was just our family and we immigrated to New Jersey, Camden, New Jersey first. Um, and that's, you know, they have a, um, a large population of um, Khmer Krom, which is Cambodians of the South, that's what it translates to, um, and that's that's my cultural heritage and, and our our cultural heritage. Um, and so we immigrated to Camden, New Jersey, and also Philly as well. Um, and yeah, it was just us, and we we joined up with our friends and relatives from um our home like the hometown in Vietnam um and yeah yeah so we we first we lived with them um uh, my earliest memories was living I, I believe we lived like up on top of a um I, I think it was like an Asian market like an Asian convenience store we lived on the top apartment um with some some friends and some relatives up there um and then afterwards, we lit, we moved to a house with some more friends and relatives. And that was kind of like my earliest memories. Um, you mentioned that a lot of people were turned away because they weren't able to pass the interview process. Um, what was that process like for you and your family, the whole uh, immigration process in general? And when you did finally get to the US, what was it like growing up in the U.S., like that transition from living in the refugee camp to being in the U.S.? Uh, again, I, I can't really speak about the refugee camp and what that was like, um, but from my parents um, hearing stories about it, like they, everybody was pretty much like on edge going into those interviews um, because they didn't want to say the wrong thing, because if they said the wrong thing, then there's a chance that they might not be able to, to, to leave and go to a different country. Um, my, my experience growing up, um, like we, we came to this country with like no money at all, except like all we had was our clothes on our backs and like no money. Um, and so my experience growing up was like, we, I just remember us 
not having that many things. Um, what we did have was my parents always made sure that we had some food and we had a roof over our heads. Um, and pretty much other than that, it was like, you know, it, it, we were poor. And so there wasn't much, many, much things to do at home. Um, and so me and my brothers, I have two older brothers. Um, we really just, just grew up playing outside with the neighborhood kids and um, just playing a lot of sports, being really active um, because we really didn't, we really didn't have anything besides that to, to entertain ourselves. Um, but growing up, it was just, you know, I, um, I got, I had a lot of hand-me-downs from my older brothers. Um, and, um, it was just, you know, it was a time like, I remember us, I remember like us being poor, you know, whenever we went to the markets or whenever we went to the stores, um, I remember distinctly not asking my mom for anything because I know what the answer was going to be. And I, you know, there was a chance that she was just going to yell at me. So I just, I just wouldn't even ask. Um, and that's just kind of like how I grew up. Um, and things started to get better as we moved to Amherst and, um, my parents got more stable jobs. Um, and they were able to get health insurance and, and other benefits that were provided to them by their job. Um, and so things started to get better for us, more stable. Um, and we were able to eventually move up. Um, as I got older, we were able to move from an apartment renting to getting a condo and eventually owning that. Um, and so like the, just what it was like for me growing up, like I just remember just starting off really, really poor. We really didn't have anything. Um, there would be some times where all I would have to eat was like rice and soy sauce and some eggs. Um, and if I was lucky, like some noodles, some like ramen noodles. Um, and then as I got older, things just started to get better for us. Um, financially. And as we moved from Camden to Amherst, um, things slowly started to get better for us. Um, and so, yeah, you know, but life for me growing up was just like a lot of sports, a lot of time outside, a um, lot of time just over friends' friends' house and just playing, you know, tag and sports with them outside. It sounds like your parents definitely worked really hard to progress in life financially for themselves and for um, their kids. And it also sounds like you also use the best of your opportunity to make friends with the neighborhood kids and invest yourself in sports. Was there a difference that you noticed growing up, whether that, you, that was your preteen or during your teenage years? Did you notice a difference in tra transition between you, yourself, or your siblings or your parents like transitioning to the US and whether that's economically or culture wise or language wise, did you mm -hmm. notice the difference in the generations and did you notice anyone struggling the most to transition? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there was definitely differences in our transition. Um, I remember me and my brothers having to go with my parents to like banks or, um, other places where they would have to talk or, or speak English and read some stuff or fill out some forms. And so my older brothers and me, sometimes we would go with them to help them out um, so that they'd be able to fill out forms correctly because they didn't know how to read. Um, my, I would say I, my transition and, and my upbringing was a little bit different than my parents and my older brothers, because you know, my parents, they're adults by the time they get here. And um, so having very little education um, in like, like job skills, like their job skills is like farming and manual labor. 
And so the opportunities that they had was limited to those things. So they would have to they would have to work either on farms or factories or doing diet like dining dishwashing or um like uh doing custodial work and my older brothers who are about four and six years older than me um their transition was slightly different than mine's in that um I think like they remembered what it was like growing up in Vietnam. Um, even even though that they were young coming over here, they were about like four and six when they came over here to the US. Um, they remembered Vietnam. And so um, I think in a sense, their transition was a bit different than mine's because of that. Um, and then for me, I mean, I feel like I, even though I was born in a refugee camp, I don't remember anything from, like from that. All I remember, like my first memories were living in um, New Jersey, like when I was four and, um, and older, like that was my first memories. And so, you know, for me, I just felt like I was like, I'm American and, you know, this, this is all I know. And so this is the culture that I know. And um, growing up for me, it was kind of difficult to be able to navigate sometimes because my the culture at home is different than the culture at school and outside with my friends. Um, and so I, I, there would be some times where I wish, you know, my name was different or I wish that um, I was white or I was just, I, I just wish that I was more like Western and like, even like, I, I grew up with like a lot of Cambodian friends and Amherst and, um, you know, a lot of them had American names. Um, and I, I remember distinctly like saying like to myself, like, I wish that I had a different name. I wish I had a more English name, a more American name uh, because of that just feeling out of place and, and just wanting to fit in. Um, and so my, in a sense that is, is the differences between um, my tra the transition that my parents had and the transition that my brothers had and the experience that I had. Um, and my brothers, my oldest brother, uh, he was able to get accepted to college, but he wasn't able to go because he had a child um, right towards the end of high school. And then my my middle brother, uh, I think he could have gone to college, but that you know he just it just he that, I don't think that was the, what he wanted. And so he ended up working for a couple of years after he got out of high school. Um, I think he went to Job Corps for a little bit, finished up that program. And then after he was done with Job Corps, he enrolled into the Navy and he did, I think four or five years in the Navy and then came back to the US and um, he was working in, I think a power plant for some time. And then ever since he's kind of been bouncing um, around from like different careers and different jobs. Um, for me, as a as an adult, I went to college right after high school. I went to UMass, um, and then after UMass, I uh, ended up working with my brother in a in his restaurant um, for a couple of years, and then afterwards, I um, made a transition to work into education, um, but. All of us, me and my brothers, when we were teenagers, we ended up getting jobs really early. Uh, my brothers got their first jobs around like 13 or 14, working in the summers um, on like tobacco farms. And for me, I got my first job at 15 or 16, working as um, a pot washer at UMass. And pretty much 
um, ever since I've been working part time in some form or capacity. And so has my brother. So, um, you know, we were able like we were there was um, a lot of emphasis on working and making money to support ourselves and also to to help um, support the family and, and pay for um, rent and help pay for like food and whatnot. Um, just a fact. I'm just going to pause for a second to see if um, anyone has any questions from the audience or from individuals. Um, because I recognize that a lot of folks have a hard stop at 6.30. So I'm, I'm trying, to, and this is, there's a lot of information impact in here. So I would like to be able to kind of break it up a little bit. So I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions um, about anything that we've heard so far. And I don't see any hands raised in the audience. And so I'm gonna ask the panelists, do they have any questions? Bella, that's a good job explaining about the culture, about life in a refugee camps, about the life struggle in the U.S. and, and also the life in Amos. Exactly. Bella, you're doing a good job. So impressed with you. Um, you, you did. And I honestly, I think pre-pandemic was at a Western Mass AAPI meeting where a, a short oral history was shown. And I specifically remembered that and I just, because it was so impactful. So I, I definitely wanna say, yes, you did a fantastic job. And that's how I kind of came up with the framework for this because it was, I just remember, and the conversations that we had as a group afterwards were so um, impactful as well. And so, Pila, I just wanted to ask, do you, is there anything else or so can anything that you, either one of you wanted to add to this or he did a pretty good job of covering everything? He does, everything is, I agree with him, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Our culture, our life uh, among the Cameroon community have not been changed much. Uh, most of our elders are still working at the farms. Uh, especially in a, a Wakefield farm and pick up the strawberries and tobaccos and the same thing, Fella. I used to work at the farms uh, after, right after school almost every single day and weekend full time. <laughs> pick up cucumbers and pickles, and, uh, especially uh, strawberry in Wakefield. Yeah, so that's our life have not changed. And for the elders and the children, of course, get a better job, just like Fela and a few other of my former students became very sexual. Uh, but in terms of parents, uh, still very much working in the factories uh, and farming. Good job, yeah, Fela. You know, then also um, to add to what Sokin was saying, is, you know, it's, um, I think there's a, just a cultural, um, you know, misconception that all Asians come here and they're successful and they're, you know, they get rich and they're able to work the system. And, you know, that might be true for some of us, but, you know, for others, it's, um, it's a struggle. And, you know, there's, there's generations that have been here, you know, the earliest generations that have been here have really, what I've noticed have had like the, most difficult time adjusting um, to everything. And, you know, I, I see um, just the, their socioeconomic status and, and their, their lives and, you know, how they're living and stuff. And, you know, it's like, they've been given this opportunity to come to this country, but because it was back in, those times when we don't really understand how to fully support people and help them in all aspects to be able to flourish. It's, um, they just kind of been plopped here and like, go do, do it. And, you know, and so like my experience, and I don't know if it, I haven't seen this video in like such a long time, but like, I remember my experience being that similar as well, where my parents, they were able to offer me and provide me with a roof and food 
But beyond that, it was like, you're on your own. You know, so when you leave this house, you're on your own. Whatever you want to do with school, you're on your own. You got to figure that out because we don't know. And, you know, we can't help you. And so it's just like, you know, the, the, the story of minorities in this country is you're on your own, you know, and groups, successful groups have been able to band together and be able to navigate and be able to be successful working the system, but then there's other groups in particular Cambodian groups. Um, and I think in Amherst and Lowell, also like Long Beach and Cali, like where that's been more difficult for us. And, and to, to add on to that, that um, if the Amherst public school have not given me the and my my friends opportunity to start school at age eighteen. I won't be at this uh, uh, you know level either. I, otherwise, I would be working in the factory with my mom still, with my brother still, uh, still, and then I won't have the opportunity to get higher education. And my family, uh, my oldest brother in Cambodia was a doctor, and my father was a soldier. Um, and both of them were killed during the Khmer Rouge, and all of us supposed to be get killed during the Khmer Rouge in 1975. But when we came here, I thought I never had a chance to get education because I'm too old. But um, a school, an Amos public school, just uh, it doesn't matter what age. My friend started at 21 years old, and when I graduated in uh, 85, I was 21 years old and still holding high school diploma. So uh, otherwise, I won't. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't imagine what my life would be like these days. But again, because the community is in Amherst is so supportive in terms of helping students and in academic support, and then help parents adjusting to life when kids in trouble. They are absolutely behind the Cambodian uh, family um, until late um, 80. And until the Cambodian American Association dissolved, until the last Cambodian who working for the Amherst Health Department uh, left like five years ago. And now we have only one or uh, two Cambodian who are working for the school system and be able to still continue to reach out um, to the Cambodian uh, families. Now, did anyone hear me at all before? Okay. So again, I it's it's a, most of Cameron came to Amazon are very successful stories. We have we have a bad story, but our kids are really struggle, but at the end very successful. Yeah, and without without the me going to Amherst for since I was six, I wouldn't have learned the history of Cambodia and just you know, from the ancient times to modern times, like I wouldn't have learned it, I wouldn't have known anything about it. And I remember being a young kid and learning about it and like all of the classes learning about it. And it was like, wow, you know, it just really um, made me feel proud about my heritage and my culture. And it also explained a lot of things to my peers. And it was just like also giving them a piece of my culture as well. So, you know, Amherst was definitely growing up was really supportive in that way and really supportive of um, promoting cultural identity and, and just celebrating us as a group. Thank you both. I just, I'm going to go ahead and offer it again and see if anybody has any comments or questions before I continue to move on. Um, and I'll say, I believe we're getting ready to go into the portion of, of your, as a teen, when you were a teenager, um, a little bit more here. So, um, Working and making money to support ourselves and also to, to help um, support the family and, and pay for um, rent and help pay for like food and whatnot. Um, just to backtrack a little bit to what you said, you mentioned that you wish that you had a more westernized name or you wish that you were white. 
Um, growing up, did you or anyone in your family ever feel welcomed by others in the United States or communities outside of the Cambodian community? Um, whether these are this was at school or at the jobs that you and your brothers had when you were teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say yes. We had a in Camden. There's a big there's a big Khmer community there, and so you know that that felt like home. And so we had like a lot of friends, a lot of relatives there, and so that felt that felt like a community for us. But I remember. Um, that there was like a lot of racial tension there. And so, you know, they, they, they told us like, um, my parents told us like, don't go over to those certain neighborhoods because um, that's where like black people live. And at that time, there was like a lot of racial tension between the two groups. And so, you know, they would stay, we would stay in our own neighborhood and they'd stay in their own neighborhood and we wouldn't, we wouldn't like mix or whatnot. But I remember being at school in kindergarten in Camden and that's where I made friends. I, I made one of my best friends. Um, he was a black kid there. And so, but then outside of school, it was like, no, like you're not, you know, you don't go to those neighborhoods. And actually my brothers, um, my, my middle brother, used to tell me stories about what it was like going to school um, he said every day he would have to run to school because he would they would have to pass these certain neighborhoods to get to school and if they were caught they were just like jumped and beat up um, and actually my brother told me about a story when he was coming home from from school one day and kids were like chasing after him and his friends and he ran just like with his friends and um he ended up tripping and falling and then um the person caught up to him and then they saw that he was a kid and then they just like kind of just let him go they didn't like do anything to him but they they just like let him go but there was like a lot of um there was like a lot of violence there and like a lot of racial tension there but when we got to Amherst it was it was almost like it was completely flipped where um, we, we didn't really have any of those issues. Um, I felt really welcomed at school um, by my teachers, by other kids. And I, I didn't really have, any, like nobody was really picking on me or anything as a new kid. And like I was in first grade. So um, I don't think at that, at that age, there's really anybody really doing that. But I remember, um, there, there was a Cambodian program um, in the elementary level, and I was a part of that as um, when I started going to school here in Amherst. And um, that that program taught us Khmer, um, taught us how to read and write and um, speak it as well. And um, yeah, and so I would say in Amherst, I felt really accepted. Um, by everybody. I don't think there was like anybody that was really mean towards us. Um, and yeah, you know, it was just like, it was just completely different. So like it, it, an example would be in Camden, everybody locks the doors. At night, when you're leaving, when you're home, doors are locked. Um, and when we got to Amherst, my parents still had that mentality um but as i grew up they still had that mentality but i just was like we don't really need to do that around here and so um i would say in amherst is like safer um than it was in camden and also i felt as an individual i felt accepted and um you know, by, by all groups. And as a kid growing up in elementary school and high in middle school and high school, I really felt like I was able to um, connect with and, and create a lot of relationships in pretty much every single group. In elementary school, in middle school is kind of like different just because um, I think just groups and, and 
friendships and relationships gets more um, formed at that time. And so it can be hard to get into those groups, like certain groups. But I was, I felt like any group that I was, um, that I wanted to be a part of, I was able to, you know, really blend in and be a part of. So, uh, um, yeah. I can't imagine what it was like to have grown up in such an environment where racial tension was so strong and experiencing violence towards you as a child, simply because of your race and ethnicity. Um, did you and your family ever connect with others in the Cambodian communities in the US? And I'm gonna throw like two questions at you. Did that give you a sense of belonging and did that allow you to accept your ethnic name? And being part of those communities, did you realize how important the Asian American community is, specifically the Cambodian community? And did that reaffirm who you are as a person and make you feel comfortable for being Asian American? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, it definitely being a part of the Cambodian community here in Amherst, it definitely made me feel um, connected. It definitely gave me a sense of um, pride in um it, you know it was just really really good to have that as an elementary school as an elementary schooler particularly because um not only did i learn about the history but also my peers who aren't cambodian learned about it as well i remember them doing like it might have been like a week long um thing like every year where we would learn about the history and learn about um just kind of like the greatness of Cambodian civilization the ancient Cambodian civilization and so that definitely gave me a um pride within that identity um and uh yeah it it just it, it was able like looking back I, I didn't realize it back then but looking back now it definitely helped me to feel more um connected and more pride um about my heritage and being asian american um just to learn about it and just to hear about it and just to know that um that's where i come from and that's that's you know my history and that's my people and so um yeah it was, it was definitely helpful to be able to um form a positive self-identity knowing those things and having grown up knowing those things and also my peers knowing about that um you know like a lot of the kids were like cool like that's so cool you know um and just like hearing learning about the Angkor Wat and um the you know the the just how amazing that structure and that 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 civilization was um was was really as a kid it it was just really cool it was really really cool and it gave me a sense of pride um to be asian and be cambodian um watching you into that you could definitely see that you've grown in yourself and you've accepted that you're cambodian you're asian american and you definitely seen you've reached a stage in life where you're comfortable being who you are growing up um the emotional turmoil that must have brought on you the violence that you had to go through the racial tension now as an adult can you talk a bit about how important mental health is especially for asian americans and Cambodians and the struggles that they have to go through can you just talk about talk a bit about how important mental mental health is in combating all that violence and negativity mm -hmm. uh well i think well, I, I'm a counselor. Uh, I'm a school counselor. And for me, mental health, because of that, is really important. Um, I, I find it as to be extremely, extremely important, especially for Asian Americans, but mostly, but like more specifically, Cambodian Americans, um, because the history of Cambodia um there was a genocide in 1975 to 1979 that killed over like three million people um and 
a lot of the population in the city, Phnom Penh, and all in the other cities as well, like those individuals were forced to go to, to internment camps and to work the work fields and they were subjected to incredibly harsh conditions and, and torture and violence um, committed to them by you know the police and like the authorities and the state government. Um, and so hearing from older generations, they like there's a, a strong sense that I have that um, a lot of them are struggling with PTSD, anxiety, depression, um, and, and a whole host of other mental health issues because of having experienced that. Um, but it's just been un, it's like they just haven't dealt with it because in the in the Asian culture and the Cambodian culture, like um, mental health isn't isn't really emphasized, and so. Um, if you're thinking about it from like an epidemial um, approach or, or um, view, they, because this generate, like the older generation dealt with that, the younger, it, it gets passed down to the younger generations um, just by their interactions and, and living in the home. Um, and so I see like a lot for myself, I struggled a lot with anxiety and depression um, as a teenager and as a young adult. Um, that was that those were like two really big things that I had to struggle with and I had to deal with. Um, and for a, a long time in my life um, that it, it was like unbeknownst to me, you know, it, it was just like, I didn't know what this was. It, it, like, it was like, I know I get nervous around people. I know I get nervous in new situations. I, you know, I, I stress out a lot about these things. And um, I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I had, I had no language. I had no verbiage for it. Um, until I got older and, and um, started going to grad school as and learning about this stuff as a counselor, um, learning about mental health and learning about this, it, it just um, it just made me realize kind of the importance and, and just how big this issue is within the community, and it's not being addressed um, that well, I believe. Um, because there's not that many mental health professionals that are Cambodian um, and Asian in general. And, um, and, you know, it's just not spoken about. It, it's just not, like, people don't talk about it. If it's not like a physical ailment, then it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, right? And, um, unless it gets to a point where like people are having really severe mental health issues, um, it doesn't get addressed and it doesn't even get talked about. And even in those cases where it's like really severe, it becomes taboo because, you know, it's just, they're looked at as crazy. And those, pe those people dealing with that. And, and um, yeah, like it, they just look at it as, people look at them as crazy. Um, and also, I think um, what what I think um, is like a potential solution is also um, something that is within a culture. It's it's there, but it's like I just don't think that it's being utilized enough. In that. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that Cambodians are dealing with in terms of mental health can be addressed through religion and Buddhism and, and monks helping out with that. Um, the issue with that is that um, during the Khmer Rouge genocide, uh, monks were targeted for um, torture, like um, death and, and imprisonment because they were the most educated and um, they had like the most 
kind of power within the country. Um, and I think it really took a big toll because they were also the ones that were working on this. You know, it's like if, if somebody's having an issue, there's no mental health facilities, there's no doctors, there's no shrink, you know, there's no psychi- psychologist or anything like that it's the monks they go to the temples to to pray or to talk with the monks to um you know kind of work on this stuff and to to help heal themselves and so um with the Khmer Rouge genocide that was completely taken away and then also um during the I I think that we I also need to mention that um the Vietnam War as well had a had a big influence on what happened in Cambodia, um, and it was and during the Vietnam War when there was the North and the South battling, um, monks were you know it was the same thing it was the same thing because they were calling for peace and they were doing a lot of peace activists and, and work around that and they were targeted as well because you know it's just that was it, it just completely spoke against the the two parties that were warring against each other and so um i think all of those variables and all those factors um really really has affected um the mental health of all individuals who are from there and i think um what i'm seeing and what i'm noticing over the generations is that now we have more and more young people um who are Cambodian who are Vietnamese who have anxiety who have depression who have um substance and and drug drug addiction and all of that stuff and um it's just not being addressed to the um to the level that I think it should be um all of those things I I dealt with that as a young um adult as a teenager um dealing with anxiety dealing with depression drug and substances um that was you know it, it's I, I feel like it's they all kind of feed into each other and it's like with anxiety and depression drugs and substances are a way out or, or just kind of like a coping mechanism and so um but then it just kind of like there's this cycle with that and um what I notice in the younger Cambodian generations is that their story is much like mine's where they're using drugs and substances to help cope with all of this and then also um there's that self-image and that self um having a positive self-image and creating a positive self-image it's just um there's not that many mainstream figures there's not that many people that we can look up to um to to help us kind of figure it out and to to form our own identity and it's uh, all of those things I think is problematic but you know the mental health aspect is is such a big piece to it um and yeah I, I just like I wish that there was there was more that we can do but um I just at this point it's hard it's hard because it's so taboo um in asian culture to talk about this stuff Mm -hmm. um no you definitely so i was just gonna break from there because there that was a lot to unpack as well um and tila uh you did a fantastic job of explaining um, I also would like to acknowledge that May is Mental Health um, Awareness Month, and so it just all kind of ties in well. Um, and I also realize that, that we're getting late upon time and folks have to um, go, so I wanted to give us a chance to, again, to open up for questions or comments that anybody has. We can all give Pila a nice round of applause for Pila. his work. Um, so proud of you, Pila that is, you did a, a fantastic job there. Um, so 
I don't see anyone's hands raised and I just wanna check with our panelists if anybody has any comments or questions to add. I just I'm just wanna, sure. Oh, sorry, uh, no, please no? go ahead, Leo. Uh, one of the things, uh, Fila, it was great to hear your story and, and it made me think about all the commonalities our, our different cultures have. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot about my parents' generation and, and, you know, a lot of Americans don't realize that Asian exclusion laws were in effect until 1965. And so it's really just my parents' generation that started to come to this country and they're coming here um, after experiencing war, whether they were adults or children, um, and carrying with them those sort of traumas and, and you know, people wonder about what drives people to go to a new country and start over again. And oftentimes it's, it's a, a lot of challenging things that, that drives that. And, um, you know, and, and I think those issues with mental health and uh, um, sense of belonging are, are very common to the Asian experience in America. Um, I remember talking with someone, uh, a Korean nurse and, she was saying that there's this uh, um, disease that affects only Koreans, she was saying. Um, and, and when she described it, it was like this melancholy, this sort of sadness, this, this sense of loss. And, um, and I, you know, I respect her, but I also think maybe it's not just Koreans that feel that, but you know, lots of people can feel that kind of um, sense of loss and that melancholy and that, that uh, need for some kind of belonging. And um, uh, so, uh, Fila, thank you for sharing your story. And, and um, it definitely resonates with the, the experiences of, of multiple generations and different ethnicities. And um, yeah, thank you. I just want to share my gratitude to you for sharing so vulnerably and also with so much clarity. Um, your story really came through very strongly and clearly. Um, and thank you. I just want to share appreciation. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And um, Richard, I know that these are in the archives at the library. Is there a specific place where people can find them? I have a link if people want to reach out to me, but uh, if they would like on their own. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, if you go to the uh, Special Collections and Archives Division uh, and their website, <clears throat> You just type in Credo, uh, C R E D O, because that's I think that's the program where all uh, forms of uh, oral histories, not just involving the Asian American communities, but also other communities, uh, are stored or 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 kept. So it's the the Credo program, um, and, and this is just searchable, easily searchable. If you just uh, make sure you go to the Special Collections and Archives Division at the, at the Du Bois Library website. And so, so far we have collected around about 15 oral histories from the different communities, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, Filipino, Chinese, uh, Bhutanese. Uh, we're hoping, of course, to expand it to include other um, Asian communities in the in the valley, um, so yeah. And I, I do have a question for Pila, um, if I may ask it now. I mean, uh, you know, after the pandemic, I mean, it's two years. Um, what do you think? What are the issues that face now the Asian American youth uh, or young people or even older people? Um, after two years of not just a pandemic, but also this rise of anti-Asian racism uh, that we see not only around the nation, but also even in our communities. Uh, what has, has anything changed or what has changed given 
these developments uh, when you're talking about the pressing issues uh, that face the Cambodian American community. Um, that's a hard one to, to answer. Um, I mean, I, I kind of almost feel like it's everything's kind of been exacerbated right now, and also at the same time put in the back burner. If that makes sense, like things have gotten worse, but also because of so many other things going on that you know our issues have gotten put towards towards the tail end of things, um, and are I, I feel like aren't you know the pressing, but it continues to be you know the all of the ailments that society we as a society have. Um, in general, where there's not many, there's not enough opportunities, um, education, mental health, um, you know, in in representation. Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious to hear from other people on this, like Leo and and do what we all think. Mm. You know, for, for myself, I, I think, um, you know, the particularly the issues about Asian, anti-Asian violence and, and hate ha, have accentuated some of the, um, and resurfaced some of those childhood feelings of, of not belonging. And, and it's strange in this world, particularly when everyone was wearing masks and you couldn't smile at people and you wouldn't know if someone standing next to you is smiling back at you or is angry. Um, it was really hard to tell. And, and um, I remember my father who likes to go fishing, he lives near the Boston area. Um, and he talked about uh, waiting for someone to leave a parking space so that he could park and go fishing. And the person started yelling at him and uh, my father started to, to feel frightened and said, you know, he didn't know if he was going to become the next victim because some person had lost their temper and didn't like this Asian guy trying to park. Um, and that feels like, um, that feels like a new level of uncertainty for, you know, do I belong in this country or not? You know, and for, for my parents who have been here for, um, you know, 60 plus years now and to have that sort of sense of feeling is um, really disappointing and, and um, concerning. Uh, and, and of course, you know, I, I don't want to minimize that feeling with, with all people of color in this country. You know, I, I think it's a, um, it's something that we're all dealing with and, and, you know, all of our BIPOC folks are, are, you know, have faced those kinds of questions at, on a regular basis, and and so it's when we talk about Asian hate, we're not minimizing that, and but recognizing that we're in so, experiencing similar kinds of things. Well, I also just want to add to that, Leo, that uh, when I went to uh, New York on April 13 and 15, we are celebrating. Cambodian New Year, but my family were visiting New York, and we heard so many bad stories that Asian being attacked uh, uh, very often these days because they still remember the when we had COVID nineteen, um, the uh, former um, administration always say that uh, it's Asian, it's the Chinese that brought the COVID nineteen to this country, so. It doesn't matter whether Chinese or any other Asian. It seems to have that effect in life because some people just look at us and say that you're the one who brought the COVID-19 to this country. So there's a little, uh, again, uh, a little hate, especially in a big city in a, uh, among the Chinese American. And when I went to visit New York, I told my family, please just watch your bike and be afraid to ride in subway and stuff like that mostly just take um, 
the uh, Ubers uh, from place to place. So they're feeling come back now, temporary during the COVID-19, the peak of COVID-19. And so I just want to say thank you all for for that conversation there. And, um, you know, there's a part of our history where, you know, everything is done so purposefully to instead of letting the minority groups work together, we are forced to be separated. And so it causes that tension. Um, and, you know, I think now that people are more conscious of that, perhaps we can work to move forward as a larger group together um, and not have it be so singulated. Because um, the more and more I learn about different histories, the more and more I learn about just how purposefully everything, some things have been done, right? Like just very specifically and for a reason. Um, so I know it's getting late and I know so many of you have um, a hard stop at 6.30. So I just want to say thank you all very much for coming out and thank you all for being a part of our first AAPI um, heritage celebration. I'm hoping like one day we can do something in person and you know I'm a big fan on food brings everybody together right and and dance and music and really um, enjoy the time spent with each other you know face to face um, and Pila again I just I, I have to give you just so many um, so much that's what I'm looking for props, I guess, because that was so fantastic. And you did such a great job um, explaining. And I just really encourage folks to continue to, to listen to the oral history that you created and also to listen to Sulkens. And then there's several other, um, as Richard said, there's about 15 of them on there, it looks like. And so, uh, Again, and you know, and I really appreciate this because from the local government side, I'm trying to say this as eloquently as possible, that we, um, the Asian and Pacific Islander community, we don't necessarily have representation. We don't necessarily hear from that community very often. And I just feel very strong about how it's needed to be included because we can't continue to make decisions without having everyone's voice at the table because the decisions that we make affect everyone and they affect everybody in a different way and that it's very important that we are all working together to make the right decisions at the right time. Um, so I-, I, I go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. I, I had to go and pick up my son from the hospital here, right here. He's just, just finished his cast. Um, and, but I just want, uh, for the record, for everyone, I just want to thank uh, Richard too for starting all of this without him uh, exposing, interviewing students and parents and educators about different cultures. Uh, otherwise, this won't happen at all. So because of him, I thank you for his times and reach out to the other communities beside the Philippines. And so I really, greatly appreciate uh, Richard Chu for you approaching us and, and expose our community to, again, to the mainstream community again, because since I left Amherst Public School in 2003, uh, I basically just travel so much that I depend on a few of my former students and also friends who stay in Amherst continue uh, reach out to Cameron family. And I still stay around, but I have not done much of the impacts. And when I was teaching and also working for the Amherst Public School, um, I used to give workshops and to the Amherst Police Department, East Hampton, North Hampton Police Department. I also give workshops to the GCC, HCC about the history and cultures, but I left it and then, so now this is absolutely like uh, filler interviews. If I have that, I probably use your interview in my presentation all the time. But thank you, Richard, for exposing again, uh, the Cambodian culture to our larger communities. 
And uh, I thank you everyone for, uh, again, uh, celebrate uh, Cambodian American and Southeast Asian American, uh, Asian specific uh, culture and history. And um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the culture with, uh, with everyone and have a good night. Uh, just quickly, thank you also to, to you, Soken, and to the Cambodian American community, and to everyone you know, who has uh, shared so much of themselves to, to us, to my students, to the communities, to us here tonight. And uh, I'm also heartened by you know, uh, Jennifer, Michelle, Mika, and human rights commissioners uh, coming in together uh, and participating uh, in, 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 and in getting involved in the lives of uh, AAPI community. So I hope that uh, this will continue. I think uh, the town of Amherst has really done really great things. Uh, Absolutely. And, and hope this continues you know, after this. Thank you. Good night. Hey. Um, so that's going to bring us to our conclusion. And I was just wondering if Richard Pila, so Ken has already got it. Oh, no, he's still here. And Leo could just stay for a second. Uh, other folks are, are welcome to stay on if they want. But I just wanted to follow up with him quickly with something. So I would say good night to everyone else. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.